This will be a lecture on Proverbs 31, the Proverbs of Lemuel and the Ideal Woman. And my name is Dr. Joe Sprinkle. Begin with the words of King Lemuel's mother, as it is described in Proverbs 31, 1 through 9. It begins the words of Lemuel, an oracle that his mother taught him. What are you doing, my son? What are you doing, son of my womb? What are you doing, son of my vows? Do not give your strength to women, your ways to those who destroy kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine or for rulers to take strong drink, lest they drink and forget what has been decreed and pervert the rights of all the afflicted. Give strong drink to the one who is perishing and wine to those who are in bitter distress. Let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery no more. Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all those who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. It begins with a heading, the words of King Lemuel, an oracle that his mother taught him. Lemuel is only mentioned here, and he is an otherwise unknown king. No king of Israel is called Lemuel, and so it would seem that he is probably a non-Israelite king. Attempts by the rabbis to identify Le Lemuel as another name for Solomon uh, seem to me unconvincing. It's the words of King Lemuel, and then it says an oracle. The Hebrew word for oracle is masa. And there's some debate as to the meaning of this word, uh, whether it means masa uh, as a uh, proper name, or whether it is the common word for oracle. Some translations translate the words of Lamuel, the king of Massa, that his mother taught him. The NIV margin, the uh, Revised Standard Version, the Jewish translation Tanakh, or the uh, uh, New uh, Jewish Publication Society translation. Uh, Delich uh, mentions it as well in his commentary on Proverbs. Uh, such a rendering requires taking the Hebrew masa as a proper name rather than the common noun for oracle. And the same discussion occurs at uh, Proverbs 30 and verse 1, where the message of Agur is, may, is labeled an oracle, uh, even though uh, there the rendering oracle can be questioned contextually and related to the geographic region, uh, the region called masa in uh, North Arabia. And uh, we uh, had a discussion of that in our video on Proverbs chapter 30. Now, if the alternative translation of Proverbs 31.1 is correct, Lemuel was king of a North Arabian tribe of Massa, uh, mentioned in Genesis 25 and verse 14 and 1 Chronicles 1 and verse 30. Uh, and this tribe, uh, they were descendants of Ishmael, of the son of Abraham, and that would make Lemuel a Ishmaelite king, if that interpretation uh, is correct. Now, this is the words of King Lemuel, the oracle that his mother taught him, and that's really significant that these are the words of his mother. The real origin of these sayings is the king's mother, so a woman is ascribed essentially the authorship of these sayings. And that seems very appropriate in a chapter that ends with the ideal woman on whose mouth is wisdom. Moving on to verse two, uh, Lemuel's mother begins with a chide. What are you doing, my son? What are you doing, son of my womb? What are you doing, son of my vows? 
And this, what are you doing? Is literally what, my son? What, my son? Um, the sense of it seems to be, you know, what's going on, or what are you doing? Meaning, why are you doing what you know better than? The New Revised Standard Version uh, renders it, no, my son, no, my son, uh, in the sense that she is chiding him for not doing the right kinds of things. Now, here he calls, she calls her son, the son of my vows, that suggests that like Hannah, Lemuel's mother, uh, has uh, uh, dedicated him when uh, she was young to God in some sense, or perhaps even bore him on the basis of a vow that, uh, oh Lord, if you do, you know, give me a child, I will do such and such for you. And so he is known as the son of my vows. Now, she gets into the content of what she has to say by talking about the danger to kings from sex and women. Do not give your strength to women, your ways to those who destroy kings, she says. Now, there is a little bit of a translation problem with the word translated destroy. The infinitive in that second line, uh, lam chot, is ambiguous. The Masoretes vocalized it as if it were an abbreviated form of uh, 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 which is a hyphial infinitive of uh, mem chet he, that means in cow to wipe clean, to wipe out, or to annihilate. Uh, you'll read about that in the, the Hebrew and Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament in 560, page 567. And it means in Hithiel to cause such, and taken this way, the verse might be rendered, do not give your ways to causing kings to be wiped out. Uh, it could be that uh, he's, she's thinking in, in terms of unnecessary war. However, the lack of the hay in the unvocalized text suggests that the form is actually uh, what in Hebrew is called a cow. And as such, it could be vocalized as a cow infinitive, uh, limchot, uh, do not give your ways to wipe out other kings, uh, kind of a similar meaning to the Hithiel kings. However, it could also be vocalized as a participle in the feminine plural, le mochot. Uh, do not give your ways to females who wipe out kings, namely kings like you. And I think the parallelism with the first half of the verse suggests that that is probably the best interpretation of the uh, verse. That's uh, 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 the interpretation that Murphy takes in his commentary on Proverbs. The other translation problem is with the expression, your ways. Parallelism with ways is with strength. Do not give your strength to women, your ways to those who destroy kings. And that would suggest that strength and ways have something to do with in, in common. Uh, perhaps it means something like strength or wealth. Uh, uh, well, that's what the uh, word hayel, which is translated strength, uh, can mean. There is some evidence that the root uh, translated way, dalat reish kaf, derak, derek, uh, in Ugaritic can mean strength or power, as uh, noted in Halot and Murphy. Uh, thus, it is possible, though an uncertain meaning of the word uh, derek here, it's not uh, fully proven. Uh, that is the way the New American Bible, a Catholic translation, the revised edition of it, uh, renders it. It renders it strength. So does the Lutheran translation, uh, God's Word, renders it power. Uh, the uh, Christian Standard Bible renders it efforts, all of which trying to find parallelism with Derek and strength uh, and uh, following uh, the Ugaritic uh, usage in that regard. Ugaritic, by the way, is a cognate uh, language, uh, a dialect, a Semitic dialect of a group uh, north of Canaan uh, in uh, the second millennium BC. The lesson here is sexual self-control. 
kings being in a position of near absolute monarchy uh, could satisfy their sexual lust to an extraordinary degree. They had the wealth to afford multiple wives and their influence as king made it easy to seduce or coerce uh, just about any woman they wanted to sleep with. It's kind of a dangerous thing for a woman to say no to a king. Today, the rich and influential sometimes take advantage sexually of subordinates. The subordinate cannot afford to lose their job, so they yield to coercion to illicit sex, or they are attracted to their boss's wealth and so yield to improper advances. But Lemuel's mother warns him against doing this. Wise leaders learn sexual self-control rather than a giving over to sexual hedonism. Now, of course, in Israel's time, uh, since uh, many of the Proverbs are ascribed to Solomon, uh, it's worth noting that Solomon was a very bad example in this particular area. Uh, he had uh, numerous uh, wives and concubines that did undermine his rule. Uh, Nehemiah 13, 26 remarks, uh, did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin on account of such women? Among the many nations, there was no king like him, and he was beloved by his God, and God made him king over Israel. Nevertheless, foreign women made even him to sin. <clears throat> also yielding to sexual temptation served to undermine the latter part of David's reign uh, after his adultery with Bathsheba in 2 Samuel uh, chapters 11 and 12. And of course, modern politicians have at time also ruined their careers via, via improper sexual liaisons, not to mention countless businessmen who have ruined marriages over such indiscretions. Verses four through seven transitions to the danger of wine for kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine or rulers to take strong drink, lest they drink and forget what has been decreed and pervert the rights of all the afflicted. Uh, the bottom line here is uh, the advice, don't be a drunk judge. The fundamental issue is that if a king gets intoxicated, he'll fail to be a just judge, but he'll forget the law or the rulings and not do what is fair on behalf of those uh, who are under uh, various unlawful afflictions. And the fact that alcohol impairs the judgment, of course, applies to other occupations today that uh, must, uh, where people must not allow themselves to get intoxicated on their jobs. That could be magistrates, that could be airline pilots, taxi cab drivers, uh, lawyers, surgeons, crane operators, and many, many other professions. Such persons and even ordinary people driving cars can be held criminally liable nowadays if they cause injury to other people under the influence of alcohol. Alcohol and responsibility don't mix very well. Now, there's several translation issues in this uh, uh, section. Uh, the uh, Kure, which is uh, how it was read as opposed to how it was written, revocalizes A uh, in the text, and it could mean uh, for uh, dignitaries uh, uh, to say, where is intoxicating uh, drink? Um, and and so uh, uh, for, in, uh, for rulers uh, to say, where, where is it? Uh, though supplying the word is a bit problematic. Or A could be a short form of ain, uh, there is not. For dignitaries, uh, there is no intoxicating uh, drink. That is, you're not to have any of that. Uh, Tanakh, uh, the New Jewish Publication Society translation, uh, puts it similarly, nor any strong drink for princes, uh, taking that alternative uh, uh, textual reading. Uh, the Ketiv seems to mean or, uh, and uh, it's not uh, translated in uh, the English Standard Version I have here, uh, but that doesn't fit so very well in context. Uh, and the notes mentions other difficulties. Uh, 
but the overall sense is clear regardless. So uh, we won't uh, spend much time on this, just to mention that there are some translation difficulties uh, in the first uh, couple of verses here. Now it's interesting, verse six, give alcohol to the one who is perishing. If you're dying, it's okay to drink alcohol, apparently. Lemuel's mother uh, makes that one of her exceptions, uh, in which case it would serve as a primitive form of painkiller. Might consider that a medical use of alcohol, although nowadays uh, morphine or fentanyl would be a preferred treatment for such things, uh, both of which are dangerous in and of themselves, but for those who are going to die anyway, it makes the process less painful both for them and for those who are watching. More problematic is the advice uh, and give wine to those who are in bitter distress, literally bitter of soul, so that they can forget their poverty. Now the parallel of bitter of soul with one who is perishing may suggest that this expression is a near synonym one who, uh, that is, one who is uh, bitter of soul or bitter distress is one who is in the process of dying, uh, in which case uh, the moral problem isn't there. Uh, on the other hand, if it's a lesser thing, that you know, uh, those who are just poor and can't stand their poverty, um, well, that, that would seem to be a bit more problematic to uh, advise alcohol that could make their poverty even worse. So I think it probably is, uh, we should take that parallel with perishing uh, strongly um, and, uh, and, and see this as, as in an, another way of describing it, those who are in bitter distress in the process of uh, probably dying. Uh, now, elsewhere in scripture, wine can be a symbol of joy and uh, here it might be thought of as a kind of Prozac used to cheer up the depressed or sad. That's how Delich uh, took it. Um, either way, uh, they would drink to temporarily ease their pain, but this prescription is certainly not for people of responsibility like uh, King Lemuel. Verses eight and nine, uh, Lemuel's mother gives a call to justice for the helpless. Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, oh, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. Lemuel's mother speaks of the need to render justice for the afflicted. First of all, she advises, open your mouth on behalf of the mute, uh, which uh, is a bit of irony. Uh, you know, speak for those that cannot speak for themselves, as the... Uh, uh, New Living Translation uh, paraphrases it. A mute person is one whom others could easily take advantage of. And those kinds of people, not just the mute, but anyone that's even similar to the mute uh, who, who don't have a voice in the broader circle of the world, uh, the king should be speaking on, uh, on their behalf and for them and to their benefit. It's important to defend the rights of the poor and the needy, to render justice for the afflicted. These are disadvantaged classes, the afflicted and the poor. It's easy for the rich and influential to get more than a fair hearing in court. They have prestige, respect, and the money needed uh, to hire counselors in court. Not so for the little people, to use Murphy's term in his commentary. So special care must be taken by just judges to see that the poor are treated fairly. As Alden puts it in his commentary, it is not enough for rulers to abstain from vices. They must also exert themselves in a positive sense over those they rule. They must speak up for those who cannot defend themselves and deal justly with those who cannot afford legal aid. So we've seen in this section then that, uh, that it emphasizes the social responsibility of monarchs. But even in a country that does not have monarchs, there's still lessons for us today. Uh, 
those uh, who have uh, any kind of uh, influence and power uh, should avoid the reckless pursuit of sexual gratification, which is ultimately self-destructive, both physically, could cause venereal disease, uh, but also psychologically to those who are unfaithful to a, a spouse or who avoid marital commitments altogether tend to be less happy. And socially, the wrecked lives and unwanted children. And so it's advice not just for kings, but much broader than that. For those who have responsibilities that can affect others badly, it's important that they abstain from alcohol or other drugs and impaired judgments, uh, at least while they're exercising their responsibilities. It does uh, allow certain medical uses of debilitating drugs, pain relief, and mood change. But these are limited to people, the dying, those in bitter distress, who become incapable of exercising important responsibilities. And as for the need for justice to those who are vulnerable in a democracy where people rule, it's important that we all work towards a society that is fair to the disadvantaged classes. So that's uh, the first section of Proverbs, Proverbs 31, 1 through 9, the sayings of King Lemuel's mother. But now we move on to uh, chapter 31, 10 through 31, which will describe the ideal woman or the ideal wife. Now, this poem is a alphabetic acrostic. That is, it has 22 verses, each one beginning with a consecutive letter of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And so you might say that this gives the A to Z of the ideal wife. Now this poem seems to be independent of the rest of Proverbs. It doesn't seem to be a continuation of King Lemuel's mother's sayings, but rather is a poem that was placed to conclude uh, the book of Proverbs. So let's read the text. An excellent wife who can find, she is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night uh, and uh, uh, provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. Uh, she considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hand, she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. Um, uh, she perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff and her hands uh, hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands uh, to the needy. Uh, she is not afraid of snow for her household, uh, and uh, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchants. Uh, strength and dignity are her clothing. She laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with, with wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. Now, this passage on the ideal woman is to be compared with uh, uh, the description of lady wisdom in the first part of the book, especially in chapters one through nine. 
In fact, the ideal woman of Proverbs 31 has a lot in common with Lady Wisdom in Proverbs uh, chapters 1 through 9. Uh, both are said to be invaluable, worth more than uh, precious stones. Uh, Proverbs 8.11 for Lady Wisdom, Proverbs 31.10 for the ideal woman. Uh, both are associated with fear of the Lord. Uh, Proverbs 1, 7, 8, 13, 9, 10 for Lady Wisdom, 31, 30 uh, for uh, the ideal wife of chapter 31. Uh, both build up their houses. Uh, Proverbs 1, 9 talks about the luxurious house that Lady Wisdom has. And so also the ideal wife of uh, Proverbs 31, 15, 21, and 27 build up their houses. The ideal wife exhibits in her behavior the characteristics of wisdom that are seen throughout the book of Proverbs. There is what looks like inclusio here. It probably goes too far to identify the ideal wife and lady wisdom here as Murphy attempts to do. But it is fair to say that the image of the ideal woman does form an inclusio with the uh, image of uh, woman wisdom in chapters 1, 8, and 9. Um, so you begin with a, a wisdom personified as a woman, and uh, then you end with a woman who uh, personifies the characteristics of wisdom. And that forms an inclusio at the beginning and the end of the book. Uh, she, the ideal woman is, is wisdom incarnate in, in a real sense. Now, the expression that's used of uh, this uh, wife is a excellent wife or a woman of valor, literally, Proverbs 31.10. Uh, it's, by the way, the same expression used uh, to praise the character of Ruth the Moabite in Ruth chapter one, uh, chapter three and verse 11. Now, rather than going verse by verse in a lot of detail, let me give you some summary of some of the uh, attributes of the ideal woman. She is said to have earned the trust of her husband in verse 11, even to the point of being allowed to manage her own servants, as it says in uh, verse 15. You know, she uh, 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 gives portions to her maids. Um, she's allowed to uh, uh, invest money that she's earned in a garden plot in verse 16. From the fruit of her hands, uh, uh, she plants a vineyard. Uh, and uh, it implies that she had acquired the land. Uh, uh, it's the fruit of her hands. It uh, was purchased from her earnings. Although uh, Delage thinks uh, the acquisition was more a cultivation of a new plot of ground already owned rather than one uh, purchased for the purpose. But in any case, she's trustworthy to be entrusted with the uh, significant responsibilities. Uh, moreover, she builds up her husband uh, one way that she's earned trust is by building up her husband rather than tearing him down. Verse 12, um, good she does to him and not evil all the days of her life. And by contributing to uh, his success in the world, uh, she makes him a better person. Notable at the gate is her husband when he sits among the elders of the land. Uh, you know, she can uh, take most of the home responsibilities. She's competent enough to do that. And that allows her husband to go out in the world and to take more responsibilities uh, there as an elder at the gate. Uh, she's also a hard worker. Uh, she's not a slacker, uh, verse uh, 27. She does not eat the bread of procrastination. She is hardworking, very industrious, as verses 13 through 16 describe, uh, working with her hands, uh, being like a merchant ship, bringing food from afar, uh, getting up while it's yet night to uh, give meals to the household, um, and then uh, 
uh, also uh, working uh, 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 the, planning a garden. Um, so she's very hardworking, tirelessly getting up early, verse 15, staying up late, verse 18, um, uh, that her, she does not extinguish her lamp at night if necessary uh, in order to do her duties. It's no doubt by such diligent labors that she's become sufficiently wealthy so as to have servants. Uh, so Alden mentions in his commentary, for the hand of the diligent makes rich, Proverbs 10 and verse four. Other characteristics, uh, she provides food and clothing for her household in the various verses, which may also implies managing the food and clothing budgets as Alden mentions. For like a merchant ship, she hauls food from afar, which implies that uh, she goes to the market and willingly braves even the snow to buy clothing and materials uh, uh, so that her, her household is uh, well-dressed, uh, verse 21. At the same time, she allows herself some luxury. She has a nice covering, apparently for her bed. Uh, bedspread uh, is how some translations render it in uh, verse 22. Uh, also has a smart dress. And in her spare time, uh, not that she has much, uh, she supplements the family income by various labors. Uh, she invests in a land for gardening, verse 16. She merchandises goods that she makes, verse 18 and verse 24. And by such labor, she has become physically strong, verse 17. She's not selfish or stingy, though. She's generous to the poor, verse 20. She's noble in character, verse 25. She's joyful despite her heavy daily responsibilities, 25b. And she is a teacher, a teacher of wisdom, verse 26, presumably to her children and servants. And such unflagging labors in manufacturing, management, real estate, agriculture, purchasing, charity, education, and merchandising, well, no wonder her children pronounce her blessed verse 28, and her husband also, and the community leaders pay her tribute. But above all, she is pious, she's godly, she fears the Lord, verse 30. Um, Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is worthy of praise. Uh, charm is deceitful. Uh, you know, you can turn it on and you can turn it off. Beauty is vain. Um, eventually, physical beauty goes away. A woman in her 20s is not going to be nearly as physically beautiful as when she's in her 50s or 70s or 80s. But godliness, that lasts. It's a trait that surpasses physical beauty which scripture does extol in the Song of Psalms because it'll re remain long after physical beauty is degraded and uh, exceeds the charm that can gener degenerate into simple flattery. Such a woman's work deserves to be well rewarded, as verse 31 says, take uh, to her some of the fruit of her hands, let her works praise her at the gates. Now you might ask, is this woman a feminist? Some readers are surprised that in the pre-feminist era, the ideal wife is portrayed as so competent, capable, independent, and the like. And this shows the biblical balance, which is neither pro-feminism nor strongly anti-feminism, but strikes a balance somewhere in between. So that's the description of the ideal woman of Proverbs uh, chapter 31. Uh, and uh, I always would say to my students that uh, if you're a guy, if you're a girl, uh, you should strive to be that kind of woman. And if you're a guy and you find that kind of woman and she likes you and you're not married, uh, uh, don't let her get away because uh, such women are very hard to come by, just as ideal men are equally hard to come by. 
Well, that's my presentation then of uh, Proverbs uh, chapter 31, the Proverbs of uh, uh, Lemuel and uh, the description of the ideal woman. And my name is Dr. Joe Sprinkle.